So when it comes to building phylogeny is that it's based off of the evolutionary history. So if it is truly a phylogeny, it represents the evolutionary history of those groups. And we'll get into some um, varying differences here in a little bit. So at first, phylogenetics was simply based on morphological traits. We're going to start with that today, and then we'll talk about DNA as well. Obviously, now we live in a time where you it would be faster to sequence the traits and or the organisms, and we can learn a ton more information than we did in the past. But I do think if you know how people started building phylogenies, then you can um, use that information to do interesting things with it. So. A phylogenetic tree, to get from something that looks like this, to get to something that looks like this, which has A, B, and C, which co coincidentally, the fewest number of taxa that you can have in a tree is three. Because if two, it would just be a fork, right? So you have a taxa block, and then you have a character block. Okay, and so the taxa block is just going to list the taxa that are in there. So in this case, it would just be A, B, C. The character block is going to have A, B, C here, and then across here is going to be a series of yes and no, one, two, and three, depending on what the characters are, A, T, C, and G, if we're doing DNA, okay? So if you are starting from scratch and programming some sort of thing to build a phylogenetic tree, you would add a taxa block, you would add a character block, you would have a tree block, but it would be currently empty. We will probably not cover that in this class, but there's other ways of doing this where you would start with a starting tree. Um, and then you would have a model. We'll talk a little bit about models, but we won't play with models um, in this class. But what we're gonna do today is this taxa block step, or taxa and character block step, so that you can build your own phylogeny with morphological traits, which is just visual things that we can compare, and then with DNA, and then you're going to use, you're going to build a little phylogeny for your final project from DNA as well. Okay, so this is an example I borrowed from a lab on the internet, but um, you're going to do the famous one in a little bit. We'll talk more about that. So we talked about how a phylogeny is the evolutionary history. We infer evolutionary history by looking at shared derived traits. Okay, what does that mean? That means unique, so new traits that groups share. If, if an individual has a new trait but nobody else has it, that isn't actually informative to us, and that is called an apomorphy. So that is a derived trait that nobody else has. I'm trying to look on this frog example to see if I can see one. I should have looked at this frog example a little bit more closely. Uh, I don't see one currently, but so all apomorphies are unique derived traits. Think of um, marsupials. We don't use, we'll talk about outgroups here in a little bit, but marsupials have a lot of weird things with the, about them that no other mammals share. And so that makes them hard to place. That is also our whale scenario. You guys are in the whippo right now. One of the reasons why the whippo is, dif like the evolutionary history of whales is difficult is because they're the largest mammal on earth, but they're entirely aquatic, right? And so just that is weird, let alone all the other, they have a lot of unique character traits, which makes them hard to place on a tree. This is often true if 
so for example, there's a big discussion in the people that study crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids as to what is the common ancestor, what would the common ancestor have looked like. And there's always been this guess, it's called a haglid, but maybe it's just that that haglid has a lot of unique um, characters. So it often gets placed at that near the root, but really, it, we don't really know. It's just so different from the others that it's hard to um, figure out. So we're looking at synapomorphies. Syn means shared, direct. These are shared, derived traits, okay? A plesiomorphy would be a trait that everybody has. So in this example, it would be like tetrapods. So all of the taxa in this tree that we're going to build have four limbs. Now, having four limbs at some point in, a, in an evolutionary history is a unique shared derived trait, but at this point, that, that doesn't give us any information. So plesiomorphies are not informative. Synapomorphies are informative. Apomorphies are not. So not, not, yes. This is what we're looking for. Okay, so if we look at these frogs, we want to um, compare the species, and we have an outgroup. It is really important for most questions, especially if your question is, what is the evolutionary history of this study system, to have an outgroup. And you wouldn't, honestly, you wouldn't just have one outgroup, you would have like five outgroups. It would really depend on how many um, individuals are in your in-group. So in-group, that is simply what you are actually studying. Outgroup, are to make these synapomorphic um, exam like comparisons, okay? So sometimes your outgroup, like if you were doing a bunch of human evolution, you would pick like a few different apes, right? Chimpanzees, gorillas, I don't know, bonobos, some examples from that. If you were looking at, um, a bunch of people from just North America, you would pick people like, I don't know, three people from various other parts of the world as your outgroup. So in that case, you would want a pretty big outgroup. Most of the time, you're looking at like three because if you're sequencing it, you're limiting your outgroup to funding, or if you're clever, you will pull your outgroup data or some of your outgroup data from NCBI. And then you would only want to sequence like just two or something from your, along with your study. Because it's important when you're doing outgroups that you're also making the right type of comparison. And you could see like if you didn't sequence those, but you just pulled them, maybe somebody else did something magical to those sequences that you don't know. Um, that's kind of the problem with NCBI. Okay. So we're going to use their um, character matrix here. I'm going to see if I, oh, nope. I thought maybe I could zoom in. Maybe I can do this. Yeah, there we go. OK, so they already built a character matrix. It looks like this, where you would have your taxa across the top. So that's A, B, C, D, E, F, and the outgroup, which sometimes we would just, that would just be G, but whatever. Um, and then they've chosen some characters, claws, chin hair, horn, tail, spikes, digits, spots, tympanum, lateral fold, nostril. Okay, and then this is a presence absence situation, so just a yes, no. Uh, a lot of phylogenies are just a bunch of zeros and ones. Even if you're doing something like, um, expression data, it's just yes or no, on or off. Uh, AFLPs and RFLPs, which in microsatellites are all um, presence absence, yes, that it, there's a band there, or no, there isn't a band at that um, weight. And then here's one at digits. I can't turn on the pen and this at the same time, I don't think. 
Um, here at digits, you have four and or five. So this is what would be called a con continuous character, meaning you have some value uh, that's along a range. Okay, really, if we were doing this, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to intermingle continuous and dis and um, non-continuous characters because that there's two different models for that, but that's okay. Okay, let's go back to normal view so that I can draw on this. All right, so we have, first of all, here, this is a tympanum. Okay, that's what the frog is using to hear, you know, like a timpani drum, it works just like that. It's essentially a frog eardrum. Okay, so there's one for the out group, do, 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 tympanum. And then there's one in B. There's one in F. There's one in E and D. Okay. Uh, let's see, claws. Yes for A, yes for B, yes for C, yes for D, yes, oop, nope, for E, yes for F. Okay, chin hair, what the heck does that mean? Um, let's zoom in and maybe we'll learn something more about, oh look, there's the little mohawk situation. Okay, chin hair. A, B, C, D, and F. A, B, C, D, and F. Horn, B and D. Oop, an F. Uh, tail, A, B, C, all of these. Great. Spikes. Hmm. <laughs> Spikes, huh? Oh, here, okay. Spikes, that's this little, um, what are those things that people who ride horses wear? Spurs, oh, they look like spurs to me. Okay, B and D, and then digits, there's four. Two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Well, this needs to be like digits on the front leg. Oh, four and then five on the back. Huh, okay. Well, we're just gonna do it this way. So I'm gonna go four for the out group, four for this species A, five for species B, four, five, four, four. Okay, that was fancy. Spots are B and F. Oh, that's E. B and E. Uh, lateral fold. I believe that's this line here. So A, B, C, E, and F. And then nostril. So C doesn't have a nostril, but everybody else does. Okay, so that's what we did here. And um, down across this bottom, we're gonna write the total number of derived traits. A has four derived traits. One, two, three, four. B has Okay, B has um one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He's weird. 
uh, C has one, two, three, four. And see, this is interesting because it's the loss of a trait, but in this case, that loss might be important. But we don't know yet, so we'll do it this way. We're gonna assume the simplest answer is the answer. That's called parsimony, but we'll get there in a second. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so this is a good time to talk about phonetics. So, phonetics would mean that you would group all the ones that shared the most together. So you would have A and C, and then off of them would be E, and off of them would be something like F. Anyway, phonetics is just what how many of them have the same similarities. So that is like that neighbor joining tree you guys made um, in muscle. Neighbor joining is literally just which ones have the least number of changes. So you just, every time there's a change, you mark it down as one. If you have the individuals that would have four changes, it doesn't matter what those changes are, or if they are even relative to each other, um, they would be grouped together, okay? Because they would get a score. So then you would just build your tree based on the score. But that's not how we actually do it. How you actually do it is you build a tree based on shared derived traits. So, oh, interesting. Let's go back here. We are going to do something fancy for a second. Um, okay. I need to Okay, now we're back. So we're gonna now build our phylogeny based on this, what we're looking at here. And so what we wanna do is group together individuals that have shared derived traits. So if we look at, well, first of all, in, if we look at tail, sorry, I didn't have my pen on. Okay, if we look at tail, the outgroup doesn't have it, but everybody else does have it. So that's good. A, B, C, D, and E, D, E, and F are all going to be within the in group, which is, was our goal. So that's great. Okay. That also kind of um, means that this tympanum situation isn't necessarily that informative, but we'll get back to that. Okay, then you have A, B, C, D, and F share claws. A, B, C, D, and F share chin hair. 
um, B, C, B, D, and F share something else. So these two traits group A, B, C, D, and F together. So they have one, two, that's the same grouping. That one's different. That one's different. Oh, that one's different. A, B. Okay, so since they have two traits here that group these two, this group, that's what I would go with next is that E is going to be some sort of out group of those traits. Let me look at E for a second. Interesting. Okay, so then we're going to go out group. E. And then here is going to be everybody else. But now we need to decide what, how to differentiate A, B, C, D, and F. So I'm gonna switch pen colors again. And we'll go from there. So in this, B, D, and F are together. B, D, F. Share horn. B and D share spikes, so that kind of is good support for that one. Um, B and D also share uh, extra digits. I don't know why my ink keeps going away. And, yep, okay. B and E sharing spots is kind of random. That doesn't really give us a lot of support for anything. A and C both don't have tympanum. That's interesting because that is support for those two being a split from the rest of these three, which we already saw. Uh, a, B, C, E, F. So this one doesn't have a lateral fold, but that doesn't give us anything and nostril. Okay, so next thing we're gonna do is we're going to split A and B are gonna go here. And then here are F, oh, I'm sorry, this is C. A and C are gonna go here, and then here is F, B, and D. Okay, I kind of have gone a little premature here because in all actuality, you don't start, you don't split a clade until you've proven that you can. So A and C both lack a tympanum, right? But what makes them different from each other? So now we have to look, they both have that. Oh, here. So um, C lacks a lateral fold, okay? So then you would say no lateral fold, right? And then here you would say no tympanum. I will tell you that usually the lack, the loss of a trait isn't um, how you split things. That's how they did it in this example. You don't want to count on losing a trait to be, to be evolutionarily significant necessarily because sometimes that's just random. Well, I mean, it's always just random, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they both lost a trait for the same reason 
or even the same way. And so that could be iffy, but that's where we'll get into DNA in a second. Okay, so then F is split from D and B because it only has four appendages or digits. It Also, well, it has um, lateral fold and D doesn't, or D doesn't, but B does, so that's a little confusing. But anyway, so here we'll put digits. D and B are different from each other. So B has spots. Yeah. Oh, and A, oops, B and D. Yeah, and then it's lost its lateral fold as well. And then has does F have anything that nobody else has? No. Okay, so that's our tree. So we have our out group, and then F, D, and B are grouped together, A and C, and then E is on the outside. So let's look back at the frogs just for fun. Um, sorry, I didn't write that down, so now we don't know it. F, D, B, A, C, E, F, D, B, A, C, E. Okay, so it's gonna look like that. So it's saying that D and B are closely related. Then F A and C are closely related. Then they get E shares a common ancestor with all of those that shares a common ancestor with the out group. And so one thing that this might tell you is or explain is why taxonomy doesn't always fly. Because um, just by looking at these frogs, maybe you would have grouped the ones with spots together. Maybe you would have grouped the ones with horns together. That actually does kind of work. Um, maybe you would have grouped the, yeah. So maybe you would have done spots versus no spots. And then you wouldn't necessarily have gotten the correct um, phylogeny. So this is why just overall similarity doesn't work. This is also why taxonomy, because it wasn't originally based in evolutionary history, can get really muddy. If those of you that have taken some sort of diversity class, you've seen this like, well, it's called this, but really it's not actually related, right? Okay, so let's do a little bit more. That's where I was supposed to draw that. Here we go. So we're, we build our phylogeny based on synapomorphies, right? This is phylogenetics when we're doing that because it's only shared derived traits. So this shared part is really important. You only get that shared part if you have an out group. And again, you won't just have one out group because what if your out group is weird? I mean, how do you even know? So otherwise, there's something called phonetics. So phylogenetics versus phonetics was a big thing for a while. Those of you like who have seal right or people that are doing during the new synthesis or modern synthesis, they were still wrestling with this phylogenetics versus phonetics scenario. Um, Phonetics is, again, overall similarity. Oh, 
Okay, this is also where your neighbor joining tree would have come into play, okay? I'm going to show you one thing and we're gonna come back to this slide. So I know this kind of um, visually is terrible, but it was the easiest one I could find. So you do the same thing when you have genetic sequence. You still have a character matrix. This is exactly what it looks like. And then you would have characters one through whatever. These would be numbered across the top. And here's your taxa. And then all you're doing is looking for similarities. Those are all A's, those are all C's. Here, you have two G's instead of C's. So that's one trait, which that's what they were marking there. A, G, C, here's a trait. T, G, T, G, here's another one. A, T, C, G, A, T, G, here's one. C, G, A, T, T. These are all the same. This is why we have, oops, here's one. A computer do this now, because it gets really mundane, and then you don't pay close enough attention. There's one. And so if you do this long enough, you'll start seeing patterns. For example, two, four, and seven are differences between species A, or things that species A and species B share that nobody else does. So that is probably significant, and that's what they built their tree on. So there's that. Um, you have this big cluster here where E, F, G, and H have this, and then the rest have that. So that is a good E, F, G, and H. Yeah, so that would be a good split here. Remember that you could just as easily have A and B up here. A and, yeah, that's supposed to be. So pretending that A and B could be here. That is the exact same phylogeny as what they're showing. It's just, um, you can always rotate at the node, right? So this tree, this branch can flip around. So then you would see that more clearly where this would be the difference between um, this trait here, C, T, 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 T. These guys, these four all have T's, these four all have C's, okay? Um, and then to split up, C and D, we don't actually have anything here. We're assuming they had more sequence and that's why they split C and D. Otherwise, it would just be a collapsed node um, where you would just draw it out to here and then draw a line like this. That would include both of those. Um, e, F, G, H, you have G and H are split because they have this C, C. And then E and F are split because they have um, different six, and so that's what you see there. And again, because we're not showing it, there needs to be a reason why E isn't F. That's a big deal. So like if you were ever doing your unknown or in microbiology or any kind of um, taxa analysis, or you're in invertebrate zoology or something where you're learning a lot of different traits, why isn't a crayfish a lobster? Why isn't a lobster a spider? Those are important questions. Um, why isn't a tiger a lion? Like what are, what happens physiologically that distinguishes those two system or those two um, individuals or species? Also, the same goes through for body parts, why isn't a muscle, your muscle tissue also liver tissue? Like what is the difference between muscle and liver? That is where the important questions lie. And that's where evolutionary history can give you information about that, okay? So if you were doing DNA, or if you were doing morphological traits like we learned with the frogs, you're going to need to go through a few mathematical um, decisions in order to look for, in order to build a phylogeny. So let's start here. When you have a character matrix and you 
whether you do it by hand or with a computer, you identify all of the synapomorphies, right? The first thing that you can do is just say, okay, synapomorphies, the easiest answer is the answer. That's considered parsimony. Least number of changes. So when we were looking back at the frogs, and there were some things where you had one that had, oh, like, mm, I'm trying to think of one. The lateral fold is a iffy one. So there's a few ways you could answer that. If lateral fold was the most important or influential character in this phylogeny, maybe the D would be where E is, right? But we went with the fewest number of changes, okay? So that's parsimony, the least number of changes. When you're using parsimony analysis and like say for instance you put in DNA as your character matrix, you're actually just looking at transitions and transversions. So you're not even um, looking at A, C, T, and G because that's too many options. You're just looking at A and T versus C and G. Um, likelihood builds one true tree So likelihood is kind of your way or the highway scenario. So it's looking at your data and has you, it builds a tree that is the optimal one peak, the optimal peak of your data. Okay. Um, I am a Bayesian person. Bayesian phylogenies have many, many options. You usually end with end up with a million trees, typically, that you've narrowed it down to, a million. And then you make a consensus tree of all of those trees. So you look at where in out of your million trees do 95% of them agree, and that's what your actual like thing looks like. This would be based on 95% agreement. Okay, um, this kind of takes this parsimony, so it takes this least number of changes, it starts there and goes out for saying that, well, maybe this change to an A and this change to an A aren't the same, right? Or maybe the loss of a tympanum isn't in A and C aren't related. They didn't lose the tympanum for the same reasons, Maybe the gene doesn't exist in one organism, but it does and it's just turned off in the other, something like that. So pars Bayesian phylogeny, phylogenetics has a lot more options. It literally has so many variables in it that you can't know all the answers and that's what it's factoring in, okay? It takes longer to do. You need supercomputing um, access for the most part, but you are more, it's a more robust search for the optimum tree, okay? If we were going to go further in um, phylogenetics, like if this was a strictly phylogenetics course, we would talk about searching, tree searching a little bit more, but we're not gonna do that. One thing I do wanna point out is because we now have started, we have such a good knowledge of genetics, we know heritability or we understand heritability, um, and we've even started looking into what used to be considered like the junk DNA, right? We can do pretty well with model testing. This means that you have an idea of how your character matrix can change. So whether it's easier to go from an A to a T or an A to a C or an A to a G, those can be weighted or whether acquiring a tail can just be just as easily lost. So when morphological traits were, play, were a major player in phylogenetics, you would say whether reversals could happen. I would argue, well, based on my experience, that even things that you thought were really hard to acquire 
and therefore would be hard to lose, that's not necessarily the case. It really depends on what the mechanism is, the physiological mechanism that's giving you that trait. But So we can do model tests. We understand um, how DNA is inherited. We understand how gene expression works now. We understand somewhat SNPs, um, microsatellites, things like this. All these different types of data that we can use to build a morphology or build a phylogeny, we can um, tell the tree searching algorithm what, what are the most likely changes. And that's what we do for a model. So every time you build a um, character matrix, you run it through a model test. Now, we can talk more about this if you ever want to do it, but um, if you're in a Bayesian situation, you kind of start with the most complicated model and you scale backwards. If you start with the least complicated model, um, if your data is weird in any way, your tree search can fail. So, but you, like you for the, these purposes, are gonna do either parsimony or likelihood. Likelihood is super fast because it's like, no, there are no other options, this is the thing, and that's it. They're all better than neighbor joining, in my, in my opinion. Neighbor joining is easy in that it is fast. It uses very little data and, or very little computational power, and it can take huge amounts of data. Because all it's doing is being like, oh, there's a, this one has a four, this one has a five, this one has a four, this one has a two. Let's group those fours together, the five, and then the two. Um, so. It's just giving an overall score that has nothing to do with evolution. So it might be biologically relevant, yes. It might ha say, tell us something about how similar those, trait those groups are. It is not based on evolutionary history. That's just the thing I want you to know. So one thing you're gonna do when you get to this point is you're gonna look at the tree you built in the neighbor joining tree versus an actual evolutionary or an actual tree based on evolutionary history. That could be interesting. Okay, so you're gonna build a phylogeny on, on a computer, but you're also gonna build a phylogeny the old fashioned way like we just did here. There is a classic example called comanicules. Comanicules. So I can't say this word. I can't even Google it. It took me forever to find this because I couldn't remember how the syllables go together. But remember we are talking about phonetics versus phylogenetics. So in the 1950-1960 era, there was Sokol, Sneef, and Kamen. Kamen was, um, I think, a graduate student. And because he is not, Sokol and Sneef published a ton of books together. They worked together a lot. And Kamen was either an emeritus professor or a graduate student that was working with them, but is not largely given authorship to anything. They were arguing and arguing and arguing phonetics versus phylogenetics. Shouldn't overall similarity just imply evolutionary history was the question. Doesn't the fact that these two things look similar mean that they share a common ancestor? And the answer is no. But how do you figure that out? Is the is how do you model that? Right? How do we know the difference? Because sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no, and that's really difficult. So they built this artificial system, okay, where came in, drew a thing. Let's pretend like it's this one. I don't think, I think these are in random order. Um, he drew a like little dude, an alien looking thing, made a photocopy of it, added another thing to it, photocopied that, added a thing to it, photocopied that for uh, hundreds of generations, okay? So there's tons and tons of these. What you're gonna do is take this PDF that I uploaded where I think you're gonna have 
Yeah, I think you'll have 28. This is just some of them. I just wanted to show you the picture. And you will build a character matrix. It, this will be a little different because you have to decide what the characters are. There's not a really a right or wrong answer to that. I, we could talk about how you determine appropriate characters and that's based on statistics, but we don't need to do that right now. Um, but so you're gonna build this character matrix and then you'll build the phylogeny from that. So this, you're gonna use this caminocules. They're much more complicated